Hello YouTube. I want to discuss the subject of Dimmis and the Jizya. You've been invaded by an Islamic army. You are now a captive subject of the Caliphate. You decide you will not convert to Islam. You then legally become a Dimmi and you have to pay Jizya tribute to the Muslims. What kind of laws then apply to you? What are the rules? What are the circumstances? What are the conditions? Let's examine and read from their own major sources, which would be the Sharia and major scholars of Islam. Of course, let's first have a word of wisdom from the Prophet. I heard the Messenger of Allah saying, Do not kill your children secretly for the milk, with which a child is suckled while his mother is pregnant, overtakes the horseman and throws him from his horse. I think it goes without saying that this is critical knowledge that everyone needs to be aware of. I, I hope you take notice of this uh, warning and of this good advice to not kill your children secretly for the milk. We do not want that milk to overtake the horseman and throw him from his horse. If we weren't for Islam, we, we wouldn't know this. So so I, I guess we should uh, thank Muhammad for this. Great stuff. Awesome. Now let's move on. There's always someone in the comment section on YouTube or Facebook telling you that puberty is when a girl turns eight, when a girl turns nine, or some kind of dodge, while the age of puberty is defined in the Sharia. And it says here, puberty applies to a person after the first wet dream or upon becoming 15. So 15, not eight, not nine, not seven. And remember, they're discussing here lunar years. Or when a girl has her first menstrual period, or if she falls pregnant, by implication, if a girl falls pregnant at the age of eight. So there you go, she was a woman. She wouldn't have fallen pregnant otherwise, right? But this does tell us that uh, you can have sex and make pregnant girls who are young. Let's leave it at that. Another legal statement out of the same Sharia manual. The indemnity for the death or injury of a woman is one half the indemnity paid for a man. Women are worth one half of a man. The indemnity paid for a Jew or Christian is one third of the indemnity paid for a Muslim. One third. That's your value in Islam under a caliphate. Of course, the Zoroastrian is worth one fifteenth of a Muslim because Muslims are the best of people. Although, if you look at the comment section, these best of people can't spell and have never heard of grammar and have no idea how to construct an argument, but they're the best of people. The Christians, of course, are the worst of beasts. But I digress. So this is important because Dhimmis effectively are prisoners of war. The jizya is effectively tribute. You pay to your overlords as a prisoner of war. Captors in Islam may be killed. Section 0914 of the Reliance of the Traveler, which, as you know, and I've stated many times, is the most popular, the most common Sharia manual in the world. When an adult male is taken captive, the caliph considers the interests of Islam and the Muslims and decides between the prisoner's death, slavery, release without paying anything, or ransoming him in exchange for money or for a Muslim captive held by the enemy. If the prisoner becomes a Muslim, before the caliph chooses any of the four alternatives, he may not be killed, and one of the other three alternatives is chosen. It is permissible in jihad to cut down the enemy's trees and destroy their dwellings. It is also permissible to kill the women and the children. I am constantly hearing about, well, Islam has these incredibly moral rules of war. Uh, no. If we go through the actual discussions around jihad from the Sharia, you'll find that uh, women and children are fair game. should be noted that under Western law, enslaving or killing prisoners are war crimes, and these are crimes against humanity. This is standard practice in Islam. The jizya is what is known as a poll tax. A poll tax is a capitation tax. If you don't pay it, it is a decapitation tax. So it's a direct uniform tax, so everyone pays the same. There's no grading scale. You pay it once per year, typically. If you're very poor, they may charge you once per month. Typically, it is 50% of your income. If you're a farmer, for instance, you owe 50% of your produce for the year, and you give that to the Muslims. I want to discuss jizya based on Quran verse 9.29. This is Tafsir Ibn Abbas on 9.29. Fight against those who have been given the scripture, the Jews and the Christians, who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor in the bliss of paradise. And they forbid not that which Allah hath forbidden by his messenger. And they follow not the religion of Islam, and do not submit themselves to Allah through confession of Allah's divine oneness. This is a 
and explicit rejection of the Trinity, until they pay the tribute readily, standing from hand to hand, being brought low, abased. Thus, being brought low means humiliation. This second entry is from the Hadaya, which is a Hanafi Sharia manual, and the most popular one within the Hanafi school of fiqh. And the Prophet has declared that capitation tax is not incumbent upon Muslims. Secondly, capitation tax is a punishment inflicted upon infidels on account of their infidelity, whence it is termed jizya, which is derived from jizya, meaning retribution. Jizya is not just a tax, it is a punishment. It is a form of retribution for A, not accepting Islam, B, not fighting in jihad to continue the jihad. You then start to fund their war. Read through the Sharia manuals and you'll discover this is what they mean. Conquered subjects become dhimmis. Dhimmis are effectively prisoners of war. Chapter 11, non-Muslim subjects of the Islamic State, the Al al dhimma Section 011.1, a formal agreement of protection is made with citizens who are Jews and Christians. There are other categories, we'll just mostly discuss these two. Again, this is a contract, we're dealing with lawyers. Such an agreement may not be effected with those who are idol worshippers, nor those who do not have a sacred book, atheists. Something that could have been a book refers to those like these Zoroastrians, who have remnants resembling an ancient book. As for the pseudo-scriptures of cults that have appeared since Islam, such as the Sikhs, the Baha'is, the Mormons, Qadianis, whoever those are, they neither are nor could be a book since the Quran is the final revelation. Such an agreement is only valid when the subject peoples follow the rules of Islam and those involving public behavior and dress, and they pay the non-Muslim poll tax, the jizya. Section 011.4, the non-Muslim poll tax. The minimum non-Muslim poll tax is one dinar. Now, they will consider that poor people have to pay a low minimum. Again, there is no maximum. They have the leverage, so they might tell you what it is that you're going to pay. Now, I want you to note here, it is collected with leniency and politeness. This is known as a lie. It is not a mistranslation. The translator knew what he was doing here. He simply lied about this. And it says here, this is collected with politeness, as are all debts. This is by no means true. Such non-Muslim subjects are obliged to comply with Islamic rules that pertain to blah, blah, blah. They are distinguished from Muslims in dress. They have to wear a wide cloth belt, the zimnar. They are not greeted with salam alaikum, peace be upon you. They must keep to the side of the street. As you read other manuals, you'll discover that they must keep to the side of the street that's the narrowest with the worst conditions, like rocks and potholes. They may not build higher than or as high as the Muslims' buildings, though if they acquire a tall house, it is not raised. Raise means to demolish, to tear down. They are forbidden to ring their church bells. Of course, when they come to Western countries, you'll hear the azan at 4 o'clock in the morning waking you up. Nor are they allowed to recite the Torah or the Gospels, the Evangel, aloud. Nor may they make public displays of their funerals and feast days, and they are forbidden to build new churches. Which is really interesting as mosques are popping up all over the place with Saudi, Qatari and other funding. If non-Muslim subjects of the Islamic State refuse to conform to the rules of Islam or to pay the poll tax, then their agreement with the state has been violated. When a subject's agreement with the state has been violated, the caliph chooses between the four alternatives mentioned above in connection with prisoners of war. That's why I led with that section, because you are a prisoner of war and you will be tried and killed as someone who has now effectively fought against the state. From the Encyclopedia of Islam, we'll look at the word dhimma, the term used to designate the sort of indefinitely renewed contract through which the Muslim community accords hospitality and protection. This would be the kind of hospitality and protection the mafia extends to the people living in its territory. If you uh, don't pay them, well, you lose that hospitality and you no longer have that protection. To members of other religions, on condition of their acknowledging the domination of Islam, as long as you know who's your daddy, they're happy to uh, not kill you as long as you stop paying your money and keep doing so. Here we have Quran 9.29, fight those who do not believe in Allah until they pay the tribute out of their hand and are utterly subdued. They're not kidding about that. Muhammad is known to have first tried to integrate the principal Jewish groups at Medina and then he opposed them violently. The essential Quranic text is 924. Interestingly, 
this edition of the Encyclopedia of Islam quotes 924 when this is actually 929. So clearly it is quoting from a different Quran, which means the Quran was different then. It is off by five verses. Fight those who do not believe until they pay the jizya, which would imply that after they come to pay, there was no longer reason for fighting them. Which means that the reason they fought you was to make you pay. <laughs> that would be the corollary of that. Now we have the term kharaj and jizya are found together. It is suggested they're being used as conventional legal terms for what was in fact the tribute or land revenue customarily paid to a paramount power. These are dues demanded from Christians and Jews for non-adoption of Islam. So you have to compensate the Muslims for non-adoption of Islam. Very interesting. Let's have a look at the word mafia. Mafia has an Arabic root coming from mafi because Sicily was once an Islamic emirate from 831 to 1072. Mafia may have come to Sicilian through Arabic Possible Arabic roots of the word include mafi, meaning exempted. In Islamic law, jizya is the yearly tax imposed on non-Muslims residing in Muslim lands, and people who pay it are exempted from prosecution. Prosecution means slavery or death. Islam always casting the first stone. The section on jizya is just prior to this in the Reliance of the Traveler, and this is the penalty for fornication or sodomy, and the legal penalty is obligatorily imposed upon anyone who fornicates or commits sodomy, no matter whether the person is a Muslim, a non-Muslim subject of the Islamic State, a dhimmi, or someone who has left Islam. If the offender is someone with the capacity to remain chaste, then he or she is stoned to death, defined in section 12.6. If the offender is not someone with the capacity to remain chaste, then the penalty consists of being scourged, definition 012.5, 100 stripes. You may die from this, and people do. If the penalty is stoning, the offender is stoned even in severe heat or cold, and even if he has an illness from which he is expected to recover. A pregnant woman is not stoned until she gives birth, and the child can suffice with the milk of another. Allah's mercy. There you go.